It's just like Phil to blame me for his problems. <laughs> and make them my fault. So I'll take the blame tonight for that. It is good to be with you and to have this time together. And I'm going to begin with a question that actually I want you to answer. Raise your hand and answer out loud. Because after all, it's Wednesday night, so you're allowed to talk. What is personal evangelism? When we say that, what is that? Phil cannot answer. What is that? Spreading God's Word. Spreading God's Word. Okay. Anybody else have any answer besides that? It's a pretty good answer. Jesse? I'd say it's more spreading God's word by who you are. Okay. So it's not just what you say, which is part of it, but it's also who you are. It's a good point. Anybody else? It's your moment to talk. I know Phil doesn't let y'all do that very often. We typically may define that in a lot of ways. When I was growing up, personal evangelism went, meant that you went out and you knocked on doors and handed out flyers or some kind of material. Or maybe it's uh, inviting people to church. Sometimes it's called personal work. Maybe it's the actual act sometimes of sitting down with somebody at your kitchen table having a Bible study. And in the process of that, you might even have come across at some point different methods to do that. Um, some of us are old enough to remember the Jewel Miller film strips. And you had to lug in this screen and film strip projector. And at one time, a record player, and eventually then cassette tapes, and it was a big deal when they put those onto VHS tapes. Now, they didn't update anything about the Jewel Miller film strips. They were still the same pictures from the 50s on VHS. But that meant you didn't have to lug all that stuff in there. Some people would use maybe today a more modern thing would be a piece of material like Ken Craig's Big Picture of the Bible or Mark Roberts' Seeking God's Way or maybe... Uh, the four lessons that Rick Billingsley uses up in North Carolina. And sometimes we get into these modes that that's what we do. That's our personal work. This is the only way I can do this. I've got to use this material. I've got to use these film strips. I've got to do it this way. And I think that approach sometimes compartmentalizes evangelism for us a little too much. It makes evangelism, for one thing, it makes evangelism something that you have to at least be trained to do in a certain way. But it also makes evangelism something that is an act you do at a scheduled specific time, rather than evangelism being part of who you just are. That is so woven into your life that you cannot compartmentalize it from anywhere else. Because it's just what you do. Let me tell you something that I've learned about evangelism in I don't know how many years. There is no magic pill. A lot of times when somebody gets asked to come in and do evangelism in a lesson, they want you to sit down and go, here's what works. There's not one thing that works. There's not one set of material that works. Some may work better than others, and some may work better than others based on who the person is. Not one way is 100% successful in our terms. And we'll talk about what that means anyway. There's not a foolproof method to teach the lost. You cannot sit down with one way to say something and everybody respond the same way. It doesn't work that way. But we still need to understand what evangelism is. Jason Longstreth uh, is a friend of mine and a professor at, at F FC and I know a friend of Phil's as well. And several years ago, he completed his dissertation on the subject of evangelism. And he researched churches in the state of Florida uh, 
sat down and interviewed 12 different congregations and their leadership face-to-face to to gather some information, some data. Now, this information is years old, but I will tell you, I think it still holds true. And what he found were five things that the research showed about evangelism currently among our brethren. And the first of those is that every congregation he talked to wanted to be more evangelistic. And I think that's to be expected, isn't it? Nobody sat down with him and goes, you know, we really don't care about saving people. Everybody understands what Jesus said in Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go in the world and proclaim the gospel of the whole creation. Whoever believes baptized will be saved. Whoever believes does not believe will be condemned. Everybody in the church understands Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that great commission we call it in that passage about there, go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe the things that I've commanded you. I'm with you always in the age. We, we know those, and no congregation said, you know what, we just don't want to do that. We see the priority, but now here's what else was shown there, that the, the support of preachers became the main way people considered their congregations to be evangelistic. And specifically, support of foreign preachers became one of the main ways in those discussions that the leaders considered themselves to be doing evangelism. There was a passion for supporting somebody on the other side of the the globe, but there was less enthusiasm for local evangelism. And they had desired growth, But what most churches have done, and I've been guilty of this at some of our works, is they have been focused on being so visitor-friendly and being what we would call sometimes friendship evangelism that they've abandoned other things. Secondly, the research showed most congregations did not have a well-organized plan when it came to evangelism. That was the biggest problem in the area of personal evangelism, they, they had ways of, to encourage visitors to come and to invite friends, but there was no structure in place for how do you share the gospel with your neighbor, your family member, your co-worker, your friend. And the research also showed there was little to no training or teaching going on about that. Wasn't any really concerted training on a regular basis Here's how you do this. Now, I will tell you, I'm going to take a side note here and just say this. I recently had someone tell me, you know, if you just expect me to teach somebody, I can't do that. But if you tell me we're going to do something at a specific time, I can show up and do that. Now, what was odd about that was 30 minutes earlier, we had told this same group of people something specifically to do in the area of evangelism, and we were told that won't work. I will tell you, sometimes there are plans, and there are strategies that are shared, but they're turned away by members. Thirdly, the research shows there is a sense of defeatism when it comes to personal work. We are, to a degree, convinced that this just will not work. I have to tell you part of why that is. Part of our problem is we're so engrossed in watching the news and being convinced about how bad our world is around us that in some ways we've convinced ourselves that nobody wants Jesus anymore. And all i got to tell you is, if you're convinced the world is that lost and dark, it ought to be more motivation to share Jesus with people, not less. One elder said of evangelism, we need some success stories. And I think that's important, that we share our successes. Fourthly, this seems like a contradiction to what I just said, but because many congregations feel like they're a failure in evangelism, they focus on areas of success. And what that means for them is they see their assemblies as successful. So we make sure our assembly is visitor-friendly, and we, 
we focus on making a well-orchestrated assembly. We make sure that there's no dead spots. And we only have good song leaders, not bad song leaders. And we, we emphasize all of those things and make the building look good because maybe that will attract somebody to come in off the street if the building looks nice. By the way, studies show none of that stuff impacts evangelism. None of that has an impact on evangelism. But it makes us feel good because we can control the outcome. Because we can sit back and we can look at our well-groomed landscape and our manicured buildings and our well-orchestrated assemblies and we can feel accomplished because we did something. And so we latch on to that. And it gives us, by the way, sometimes that will cause numerical growth, but most often it's numerical growth by people who move into the area or switch congregations. And so we sit back and we think about how much we've grown, but we've not saved anybody. We're just swelling is what we're doing. That's a false sense of growth. And then fifth and finally, what the research showed is that most congregations had developed a professional evangelist mentality, or what some might even describe as a pastor mentality in our culture. And that just simply is this. The preacher is hired to do evangelism. It's his job and only his job. He takes all the contacts. He does all the Bible studies. In fact, the congregation's actually discouraged by do it, from doing evangelism and told to just pass the names to this person. He'll take care of it. And many leaders that were interviewed in this study expressed the reason for that is they were just afraid that their members wouldn't be comfortable having Bible studies with non-Christians. And they can make the contacts. They might even sit in on the studies with the preachers, but the members aren't willing to teach on their own. And so they just leave it to the professionals. Well, let me tell you what that tells you is it gives this mentality. Don't do this at home. We've hired somebody to do that for you. Well, I think one of the things you've got to understand is, as we kind of think about that result of that study, is that evangelism is a responsibility of all of us as disciples. The reason it's called personal work is because it's supposed to be personal, as in you are the person doing it. That's the reason for that. The idea of personal evangelism is the idea of ordinary common Christians talking about Jesus to the people around them. That's what that means. The non-professional, non-clergy people in our world's terms. Or the layman. We think about evangelism in the Bible as being done often by the professionals. In the book of Acts, when you read through Acts, and you begin at the beginning in Acts chapter 2, it's Peter, an apostle, who's teaching and 3,000 souls are saved. And then in chapter 3 and 4, it's Peter and John at the temple and they're preaching. And then you have there in chapter 4 up to 5,000 men. You go to Acts 10. Who teaches Cornelius? It's it's Peter that teaches Cornelius. Who teaches Lydia and the jailer in Acts 16? It's Paul, an apostle, who teaches the Corinthian brethren and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue in Acts 18. It's Paul. And so we, we read through there and we think about, well, Peter and Paul are evangelists by trade in a sense. We think that's their career, their focus. They're professionals. These trained men are the ones that are to do that. But what about Stephen? And then after Stephen is put to death, do you remember what happens there in Acts 8 and verses 1 through 5? Saul approved of his execution, talking about Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen, made great lamentation over them, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now those were scattered, went about preaching the word in verse 4. Did you see that earlier it said that the apostles were not scattered? They stayed in Jerusalem, but those who were scattered went about preaching the word. It was the non-apostles that left Jerusalem in Acts 8 and taught other people. 
It wasn't the professionals. It was the ordinary disciples that went out spreading the gospel. Men and women who had been taught then went and taught other people the story of Jesus. We have got to learn that evangelism is the responsibility of all of us. And to make that clear, I don't have a responsibility to evangelize because I'm a preacher. I have a responsibility to evangelize because I am a child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you are too, then you have that same responsibility to go out into the world and to preach the gospel to everyone. Homer Haley wrote in his book years ago, carrying out the Great Commission, he said, there seemed to be something missing or wanting in our present day evangelism and in our edification and building up of the body of Christ. We become indifferent to the urgency of work that God has laid on each individual. This is our work. God gave this to us as a job to do for Him. And by the way, this kind of work, this kind of teaching, typically does not happen in this room. Because the lost don't come here on a regular basis. Maybe sometimes, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about going to where they are, having this urgent responsibility that if my neighbor doesn't know about Jesus, I have a responsibility to tell my neighbor about Jesus. To open that door and to share the gospel. But I think part of our problem is this. What do you think is successful evangelism? Another time for you to talk, not fill. What is successful? What do we commonly think makes Bible teaching to the lost successful? Yes? That's right. When we get them over there. And we have a mentality that if we don't get them in the water... It's not successful. We live in a very data-driven world. Our kids go to school, what do they get? They get grades for how well they did. And that grade becomes a part of a data set that puts them in the order when they graduate high school of the best to the worst based on those data points that we've taken over their four years. And we do the same thing in college, and then you go to work, and at work, you have goals and quotas to be met, and you are graded typically by a set of data points at work. How much you produce, your sales, how well you do certain things. And so our entire life, for the most part, has been driven by data. And so we take that to this area of understanding. And evangelism data we think about is baptisms. And so we read Acts that way. We begin in Acts chapter 2, and starting there in verses 40 and 41, with many other words, he bore witness. This is Peter, continued to exhort them, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who received his word were baptized. They were added that day 3,000 souls. Chapter 4 and verse 4, it says 5,000 men. You go to, to uh, chapter 8, you start getting into the success stories. Philip goes to Samaria. And there in Samaria, many people believe, including Simon. Later in the chapter, Philip intercepts the eunuch. And in verse 38, he commands the chariot to stop. They both get on the water, Philip and the eunuch. And the eunuch is baptized. In Acts chapter 9, more success. Saul, this great persecutor... Baptized, Acts 10, Cornelius, a Gentile, baptized, Acts 16, Lydia in verse 15 is baptized with her household, and later in verse 33 of Acts 16, the jailer and his family in the same hour of the night were all baptized. We read through all of those stories and we see success. Baptism, baptism, baptism. In fact, 
Before the scattering in Acts chapter 8, they think that there could be thousands, more than 10,000s of Christians in Jerusalem. And we look at that and think about all of the success in the book of Acts. And we go teach somebody and they aren't baptized and we go, well, I just don't know what I'm doing. But go back through the book of Acts. Because in Acts chapter 4, yeah, it comes to 5,000 men, but you also have the Jewish leaders who should have accepted the gospel, who are so angry and reject the message, they actually put Peter and John in prison, don't they? And then you go to Acts chapter 5, and again, the Jewish leaders reject the gospel message, and they arrest the apostles. Now, we don't see that as a rejection of the truth and a failure of evangelism, but it is a rejection of the truth when they're doing this. Acts 6 and 7, Stephen preaches boldly, and they stone him for preaching the, the truth. I mean, think about, is there a more serious rejection than death for sharing the gospel? On his journeys, Paul would go to the synagogues and he would preach for a few weeks or reason with them and he would be cast out of the synagogues and end up with the Gentiles. And he did that everywhere he went. Every time he went and was rejected from the synagogues, that in our terms, what we just said, that's a failure. Now, we call Paul the greatest evangelist that ever lived, but he failed in every city he went to according to our own standards. In Acts chapter 14, Paul is stoned in Lystra. In chapter 17, the Thessalonians get mad at him. He goes to Berea and the Thessalonians are so mad at him, they follow him to Berea to stir up trouble there. I have never had somebody, by the way, get so mad at one Bible study, they showed up at the next one with somebody else to stir up trouble. But that's what happened to Paul in Thessalonica and Berea. In Athens, he presents this great sermon there, using the temple to the own unknown God. And how do they respond? In, in chapter 17 there, in verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, we will hear you again from this. Paul went out of his midst. Some men joined and believed. But also some didn't. In Acts 26 and 28, Agrippa says, almost. Almost. There are just as many rejection stories in the book of Acts as there are acceptance stories. But we are so driven to see baptism as a success, we only look at that side. Listen, here's the question. Were the disciples, were the apostles, failures at sharing the gospel? Well, no. Was Paul a failure or was he a success? And maybe better is to ask this question. What about Jesus? Was he a failure when it came to teaching? By our standards, he is. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, there's a story we know where he says he was sitting out on his journey and a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him, loving him, said, You lack one thing. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor and you have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. And disheartened by the saying, he went way sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That young man in Mark chapter 10, when Jesus told him what he needed to do to be saved, said no. And walked away. That is the equivalent to us today teaching somebody and them not being baptized. We consider that a failure. Was Jesus a failure? Well, no. Your, your dictionaries define, by the way, evangelism the same way. Merriam-Webster defines it as the winning of a personal commitment to Christ. But that's not what evangelism is. The word evangelism doesn't really occur in the Scriptures, but the word evangelist does three times. The first of those is in Ephesians 4, 
In verses 11 through 12, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, the building up of the body of Christ. And that passage is interesting because it applies the role of evangelism to something we don't even think about talking about here tonight, which is the equipping of existing disciples, not the winning of disciples. I will tell you that one of our failures in evangelism when we have a baptism is success mentality is we get people into the water and it stops there and we don't do any equipping or growing or ministering to those people once we get them out of the water. And the retention rate among us is very low because of that. And one of the things you've got to understand is evangelism is not just baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but it is also teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded to you, according to what Jesus said in Matthew 28. The second place is in Acts 21 and verse 8, where Philip is called an evangelist. The same Philip from Acts 6, who was selected as one of the seven men, who's also the same Philip in Acts chapter 8, who in verse six went down, or verse 5 went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And in verse 12, when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. And we see here Philip is an evangelist who goes and shares the good news. The third time is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 5 verses there, I charge you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by His appearing in the kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, will turn away from listening to the truth, wander off in the mist. As for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. What's the work of an evangelist? We would go back to Ephesians 4 for that, I think. Here's what's interesting about that is the Bible does not seem to define evangelizing the same way our dictionaries or we do. We define it as baptizing people. And the Bible defines it as proclaiming the good news. Teaching. Evangelizing is teaching. If you don't get anything else tonight, get this. God is no less pleased when we teach someone and they are not baptized than He is when we teach them and they are baptized. Of us. Because what He expects of us is to teach. To teach. Successful evangelism is any time the good news about Jesus is shared. Does that mean we, that a baptism is not something to rejoice? No, we should rejoice about that. Heaven rejoices about that. We should too. But that is not why we evangelize. We evangelize to share the good news about Jesus regardless of how people respond. In Matthew chapter 13, there is that parable of the soils that Jesus taught. There in those first eight verses where they go out and spread the seed and some of the seed falls on the path and some falls in the rocks and some falls and takes root and the thorns grow up and some falls and produces on good soil. And they were confused by that parable there in the first eight verses. So down in verse 18, Jesus explains it. We'll read that. He says in verse 18, Matthew 13, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, 
This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Now, now there are four types of ground. And three-fourths of the ground does not produce the kind of fruit we think is only successful. Nowhere in that parable does Jesus then tell the disciples, now what you do is, you go out and you test the ground before you sow the seed. Your job is to look at somebody and figure out, before you talk to them about the gospel, are they rocky ground? Is this somebody that the cares of the world is going to choke out in a couple of years? Or are they good soil? Nowhere were we asked to test the soil. We're just simply expected to sow the seed. You know, in Corinthians, when Paul talked about their division, and he talks about that he planted and Apollos watered, the thing to remember is it was God who gave the increase. Our job is to plant and water and let God take care of everything else. I tell you, one of our problems is when it comes to evangelism, we're too busy trying to play God instead of being Paul and Apollos. Here's the reality of evangelism. Sometimes you're going to teach... And the seed's going to fall on the path next to the field. And the birds are going to take it away. Sometimes you're going to talk to people about Jesus and they don't want anything to do with that. And they'll tell you that real quick. Sometimes you're going to teach and it's going to fall on rocky ground. Which means they may respond favorably for a while, but then they dry up. Sometimes you teach and it falls and it plants, but thorns come up. The world gets in the way. And they just don't stick around. They die out. But sometimes. Sometimes that, that seed falls on good ground. And you get to see that plant blossom and grow. And eventually, it starts sowing seed. Sometimes that falls on good ground. Anybody here like to fish? Play golf? Let me tell you something about both of those things. I love to fish. I kind of like to play golf, although I have not in years. But I will tell you this. If I applied the same metric of whether I was successful or not to golf and fishing and a lot of other things in my life, I would sell our boat and I'd get rid of every golf club and golf ball I ever had. Here's, here's my golf game, by the way. I hit one decent shot around that convinces me I got to play again. And when we go fishing, if you catch one good fish... That's enough to get you to go back again. But when it comes to evangelism, for some reason, if we don't get somebody into baptistry every time we talk to them about Jesus, we quit. We give up and quit. And we say things like, it just doesn't work. People don't want to hear about Jesus. I've tried. I must not know what I'm doing. I don't know what to say. One of my favorites is, well, what if I say something wrong? And I want to be like, about Jesus? Do you love Jesus? 
Do you know what Jesus has done for you? That's not hard to tell anybody. Don't overcomplicate this. There's no magic pill. There's no one way to do it. Oh, sure, you may get to a point where you need Phil's help. But you have a responsibility to share the gospel. And if Jesus has saved your soul, then you can tell other people about that. It is not as hard as we make it. <coughs> if Phil hadn't torn up the PowerPoint, I was going to share some pictures with you of some people that are very dear to me. One of them is Alex and Amanda Johnson. Two Saturdays ago, I got to sit at one of my favorite barbecue places back where we used to live with Alex and Amanda and their two precious kids. Alex was my trainer at the gym years ago. Obviously, he's not very good at his job. <laughs> but through our relationship, Alex put on Christ and his wife did too. And it was just because we formed a friendship. And one day, I didn't want to work out. And I said, if, you, if I do what you make me do today, then I get to train you next week. So Alex walked in the next week, and he said, all right, what are we doing? I was like, what are you talking about? He said, you're running training today. I said, oh, no, we're going to lunch after this. I don't do physical training. It's obvious. <laughs> we're going to do some spiritual training. We talked about Jesus for weeks. We went to lunch every week from there on out. You can see the picture of John and Crystal Dean. John's one of our deacons. He's a disciple because another one of the deacons was his next door neighbor, studied the Bible with him. And that neighbor's name is Brandon. Brandon moved to a different neighborhood. And within three months, there was a block party, and Rob and Melanie Rogers are now Christians because Brandon talked to them and they obeyed the gospel. It's not hard. Now, has. Have there been people that Brandon's talked to that said no? Yes. But Brandon doesn't quit. I'll show you a picture of my bonus kid, Devin, who's my daughter's best friend. They got to know each other on soccer because Devin had the only empty seat on a bus trip to a game. Two months ago, I baptized Devin into Christ. I never sat down and studied with Devin, by the way. She went to church with us, and she talked with my daughter. And I will tell you that for some of us who have been disciples for 30 years to say we can't talk to people about Jesus, but my 17-year-old daughter teaches her best friend, it should put us to shame. I don't share that to guilt trip you. I share that to say... Yes, if we will just do it and go out and talk about Jesus, we will find good ground. You will have to go through the path and the rocky ground and the thorns, but there is good ground out there. There is good ground. You will never find it, though, if you don't spread the seed. Successful evangelism is not when you get somebody in the water. It's when you share the good news about Jesus, regardless of how they respond. That's what pleases God. Sharing the message is what pleases God. And that's what we have to focus on. The good news is that Jesus did come and die as that sacrifice for you to wash away your sins, to restore you back to relationship with God. If you don't know how that happened, then come talk to one of us. 
Phil, Michael, me, Jesse, Larry, will tell you. But if you're here and you've known about that and you've not obeyed and not accepted the gift of grace through the blood of the Lamb, why not? Why not be a success story tonight in that sense that you put on Christ? By the way, that is our first personal success story spiritually is when we make that commitment. That makes our spiritual life successful. And if you'd like to do that tonight, we'd encourage you to do it now while we stand and while we sing this song together.